If you would like to claim continuing education credit for attending today's session, register with CDC's Training and Continuing Education Online System and search the course number on the screen for the Hospital Sepsis Program Core Elements Webinar Series. Thank you for joining us for the fifth and final installment of our Hospital Sepsis Program Core Elements Webinar Series. Before we get started today, I have three disclosure slides to show related to the CE that's being offered through CDC's Training and Continuing Education online system. I will advance through them slowly to allow you time to read. The first is the following accreditation statement. This webinar is accredited for CME, CNE, CEU, CHES, MCHES, CPE, and CPH. I will now share with you the following disclosure statement from CDC. CDC, our planners and presenters, wish to disclose that they have no financial relationships with ineligible companies with the exception of Dr. Erica Kaufman-West, and she wishes to disclose that she was on the Speakers Bureau for Gilead and AbbVie for Hepatitis C. All relevant financial relationships listed for these individuals have been mitigated as she has divested the financial relationship. Presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept financial or in-kind support from any ineligible company for this continuing education activity. I will now share the following joint accreditation statement for pharmacy education and give you a few moments to read on your own. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our final session of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Project First Line Hospital Sepsis Program Core Elements webinar series. Over the last few weeks, we have explored the intricacies of the new Hospital Sepsis Program Core Elements. These core elements complement existing sepsis guidelines. The goal is to assist U.S. hospitals in implementing, monitoring, and optimizing their institutional sepsis programs to improve sepsis outcomes. I'm Erica Kaufman-West, the Director of Infectious Diseases at the AMA. As you know, sepsis occurs when an infection you have triggers a chain reaction throughout your body. Sepsis is a life-threatening medical emergency that requires rapid detection, accurate management, and a multidisciplinary response. This webinar series has broken down each of the core elements to help facilities build new sepsis programs and strengthen existing ones. Today, as in the past, a CDC expert and their partners will share strategies, real-life examples, and best practices for successfully implementing the sepsis program core elements. To wrap up the series, we will focus today on education. We will be hearing first from a sepsis expert who will provide an overview of the core elements and outline what role education plays in a successful sepsis program. Then, we have three more experts who will provide real-life examples of how they have helped ensure their hospital staff have a strong knowledge of sepsis and understand their role in the team-based management of sepsis. They will also explain how to educate patients, their families, and caregivers about what sepsis is and what to expect during hospitalization and post-discharge. We will conclude with a question and answer session with presenters answering your questions, so please submit them in the chat box on your screen. If time allows, we will address the questions you submitted during registration. Unfortunately, there may not be time to answer all the questions. Also, if the slides appear blurry on your screen, please increase your screen's resolution by clicking on the bars at the bottom right of the video player and selecting a higher quality setting. In addition, you can always replay the video if you miss anything. I'd like to introduce our sepsis expert, Dr. Hallie Prescott is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Michigan and a physician at the Ann Arbor Veterans Affairs Healthcare System. She's an internationally recognized expert in sepsis management and outcomes. She serves as the co-chair of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines and physician lead for the Michigan Hospital Medicine Safety Consortium's Sepsis Initiative. She'll give an overview of all the core elements and then discuss the core element of education and how creating awareness and furthering knowledge from patients and their families to physicians and nurses are required if we want to improve sepsis outcomes. Dr. Prescott. Great, thanks so much, Erica. It's an honor to be here again today, um, introducing the core elements and talking specifically about the education core element. Next slide, please. Um, I'll give people just a moment to read the disclosures here. Great. 
Next slide, please. Um, and on this slide, um, we share results from a morbidity and mortality weekly report that was published over the summer um, that provided information on the current state of hospital sepsis programs throughout the country. Um, we learned that 73% of hospitals currently have a committee um, that is tasked with addressing sepsis. But we, when we dig deeper into the um, composition and activities of these committees, we find that there is further opportunity for improvement. For example, we found that only 55% of hospitals um, provide any sort of dedicated time to the individual or individuals who are leading the sepsis program. Uh, we also found that only 55% of hospital sepsis programs have um, collaboration or coordination with hospital antimicrobial stewardship programs. So um, we think that there is work to be done in terms of uh, ensuring hospital um, sepsis programs throughout all hospitals, and also in terms of strengthening the structure of the hospital sepsis program activities. Next slide, please. And so the purpose of the hospital sepsis program core elements is to provide guidance for monitoring and optimizing the hospital management and outcomes of sepsis. Essentially, this is a manager's guide of how to build a successful hospital sepsis program. And we provide emphasis on uh, leadership support, so hospital leadership support of the sepsis program, ensuring the necessary personnel um, resources are available to the sepsis program to carry out its work, um, and then also use of quality improvement tools and implementation science to ensure the best translation of um, the sepsis program work. Um, this guidance is really meant to complement existing sepsis guidelines and facilitate the implementation of recommended practices in um, evidence-based guidelines. Um, one key distinction um, uh, from prior um, um, initiatives related to sepsis is that the Core Elements really focuses broadly um, from very first recognition all the way through hospital discharge and recovery, whereas prior um, many prior initiatives have really focused on these kind of first six hours or golden hours in the management of sepsis. And of course, those are critically important and are in a focus of the core elements, but there's also a broader focus to the core elements. Um, the core elements are intended to um, be applicable to all U.S. hospitals and hospital systems, um, and there is flexibility built into them. We recognize that one size will not fit all, um, but the guidance should be broadly applicable regardless of setting and also um, for hospitals just getting started with developing a sepsis program, as well as for further strengthening sepsis programs that have been exist in existence for many years. Next slide. Um, the core elements um, include several documents. So on the left hand, there is the core elements uh, document itself. This is the guidance that walks through um, each of the core elements, provides the rationale and provides examples. Um, also included is a hospital self-assessment tool. So this allows you to go through and evaluate the current state of affairs at your hospital and then identify um, areas um, for next steps in terms of getting started to build your program or to further strengthen your program. Additionally, on the right-hand side, we have an overview graphic that provides a high-level summary of the seven core elements. Next slide. Um, so here I'll walk through the seven core elements. The first is the hospital leadership commitment. Um, this is having engagement and buy-in from hospital leadership and recognizing sepsis as a priority at your hospital and healthcare system. Accountability has two pieces to it. The first is identifying a specific or two specific leaders to guide the sepsis program and to be responsible um, for its day-to-day um, uh, -day activities and outcomes. And then also to set concrete goals for the hospital sepsis program and to evaluate progress towards those goals and to update those periodically, such as annually. Multi-professional expertise recognizes that sepsis is a program that or a condition that absolutely requires um, multi-professional expertise. And so we lay out um, who we think are key uh, individuals to engage in hospital sepsis work. Action refers to the structures and processes at your hospital to help support the implementation of recommended best practices. 
Tracking and reporting go hand in hand and refer to monitoring uh, management and outcomes of sepsis at your hospital and reporting that information back to key stakeholders within your hospital. And then education is the focus of today's webinar and speaks to education of clinicians, uh, healthcare staff, patients, families, and caregivers. Next slide. I'll now walk through the specific examples that we give um, of education. And as with all the other core elements, the examples are stratified into priority examples, um, which we would recommend as starting points, as well as additional examples. So priority examples for education include providing sepsis-specific training or education during the onboarding process for staff and trainees. So for people who are new to working at your hospital or healthcare system. Uh, we also recommend having annual sepsis education for all clinical staff and having a mechanism to provide written and or verbal sepsis education to patients, families, and or caregivers prior to hospital discharge. Next slide. In terms of existing ex uh, additional examples of education, um, include posting information on sepsis recognition in prominent areas for patients facing staff, such as on the machines that are used to collect vital signs or in staff break rooms, providing annual lectures, such as grand rounds um, focused on sepsis, and then including sepsis recognition and treatment in annual nursing competencies. I will close by putting a plug out for the CDC's Get Ahead of Sepsis program. Um, on their website, there are uh, a number of different materials um, that help provide education on sepsis, both to healthcare professionals, as well as to um, lay members of the community, patients, families, caregivers. Um, so that is one good resource to help support your educational activities in your hospitals. Um, I will close there and turn it back over to Erica. Thank you. Thank you for explaining the various ways facilities can educate their professionals and patients. Given the multitude of ways a facility can provide sepsis education, I'm excited to see some real world examples. Our panelists today are Ms. Alexis Wells, Ms. Jessica Aguilar, and Dr. Stephanie Parks-Taylor. Our first presentation will be given by two of the panelists. Ms. Alexis Wells has been a registered nurse since 2008, working in various areas, including critical care, telemetry, bone marrow transplant unit, home hospice, and the clinical documentation integrity program, all of which have provided a well-rounded foundation to transition to her new role as a quality educator. In this role, she's providing education across the hospital on various topics related to quality performance and patient outcomes. Alexis serves on the sepsis committee at the local and community levels and advocates for making it easy to do the right thing. Ms. Jessica Aguilar is the sepsis coordinator at John Peter Smith Hospital and has been in the sepsis program almost four years. She started her healthcare journey in 2001 as a pharmacy tech, then obtained her EMT, followed by her paramedic, and eventually her BSN. She has been an, a nurse almost nine years. Prior to her sepsis role, she was a pediatric nurse and worked in the emergency department as JP, at JPS. Alexis and Jessica, can you show how you incorporated this education element within your sepsis program? Absolutely, we can. So good afternoon, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I speak on behalf of JPS and the whole network when I say that Alexis Wells and I are so grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak today on sepsis education at our facility. Um, like she said, I am the sepsis coordinator. I get to work alongside the illustrious Alexis Wells, who's our quality educator and a huge, huge part of our sepsis team here at JPS. Um, today, we're going to go ahead and take you on a journey on how we provide sepsis education and the multiple modalities that we use to reinforce that education to facilitate prompt recognition of sepsis through positive patient outcomes. So to give you a little bit of a background on our facility, we are a level one trauma center. We are a safety net county hospital. Um, we do medical trauma as well as we are the psychiatric emergency room for the county. Our facility is nestled in the little 76104 zip code in the heart of Dallas Cowboy County, which is also known as Tarrant County here. JPS is licensed for 582 beds, and we have almost 177,000 hospital patient days per year. We are the 16th busiest emergency department in the country with almost 126,000 total ED visits every year and growing. 
We also have around 4,000 babies born each year, and we are a level three NICU and a level four maternal designated levels of care facility. Um, we also have a huge push that we are doing here. Um, when we talk about maternal sepsis, this is a really dear, near and dear to my heart. I won't get into it, but it is a lot of the education that we have been doing this year. So we are sort of are designated by the ANCC with Pathways to Excellence. Um, we promote excellence in our facility. Um, we have the largest family medicine residency program. We are also certified in stroke, AMI, uh, patient blood management, as well as sepsis. So for us in sepsis, um, we are the only um, Joint Commission disease specific certified program in the nation, that's a safety net county hospital. So as you can tell, we're really proud of our sepsis program here, proud of our hospital, all the accomplishments. But more importantly, I really hope this uh, presentation allows you to look inside at the community that we serve and the education that we deliver. So with that, I'll turn it over to my partner, Alexis Wells. Thank you so, so much. Um, so thank you again for joining us as we share how we educate everyone at our organization. We're going to begin with what I consider to be the traditional education. Uh, we have the opportunity to get in front of our providers during their onboarding. So as mentioned previously, uh, this is important because it lends the new providers um, the focus. So what we're looking at for sepsis and who they can contact when they have questions. The same philosophy applies to new nursing and provider residents, because as Jess had just mentioned, we are home to the largest hospital-based family medicine residency program. Being a part of their onboarding establishes a relationship early on, and if you only get a few minutes with them, ensure you leave your contact information because they will use it later in their career. Speaking of later on in their career, uh, the next slide covers ongoing traditional education that takes place after orientation. This includes uh, committee and department meetings, one-on-one -on -one education, and taking every opportunity possible to provide resources so it is easy to do the right thing every time. After establishing a sepsis program at your organization, if you have not done so already, you should be offering at least a monthly committee meeting with your champion stakeholders and program leaders, and they should be disseminating that information to their departments. This setting provides you the chance to discuss fallouts from best practice, which we call Opportunities for Improvement or OFIs. New tools or publications like the CDC's Hospital Sepsis Program Core Elements Assessment Tool, as well as working on streamlining processes on identifying and treating sepsis. One-on-one -on -one education is essential and cannot be overlooked. Sometimes key points can get lost in translation through email or text, and you can have a more meaningful and deeper discussion in person, especially when it comes to OFIs. Although nurses do need one-on-one -on -one education on OFIs as well, don't get me wrong, we also have taken this opportunity to teach our nurses how to talk to their patients about sepsis and post-sepsis syndrome. We have provided them with a resource to start that conversation about what is really happening with their patient and what to look out for after the patient goes home. Sepsis isn't a really bad infection or a bloodstream infection, it's sepsis. And our patients need to hear that term and understand what is going on with them. Without telling them they have sepsis, how will they learn about post-sepsis syndrome? Patients need to know how to care for themselves after recovering from acute insult from sepsis. And we believe so strongly in this that our perception of care and talking with the patients about post-sepsis syndrome is one of our joint commission metrics for certification. The sepsis RN at our organization who works very closely with Jess does rounds on patients diagnosed with sepsis and simply asks them, did your nurse or provider talk to you about the long-term outcomes of sepsis? If the answer is no, then the sepsis RN provides education to the patient right then and there. Through these discussions, we can identify barriers or struggles with providing care and we can do something about it. 
At JPS, we've created multiple tools right within our electronic medical record, like smart phrases, smart lists, order sets, and best practice alerts, or BPAs, to help guide the providers and nurses taking care of a septic patient. We also hand out badge buddies during every encounter and post the sepsis algorithm at various stations to facilitate quick decision-making right at their fingertips. As we move away from traditional, it's important to keep in mind that we're not limited to only in-person education and that everyone learns differently. Providing a platform that allows self-paced learning, like through annual or elective computer-based learning modules, or CBLs, is another way to educate your staff on sepsis. A key point to keep in mind with this type of learning platform is that you should offer education tailored to their learning environment, since an educator is not going to be present during this uh, learning. Jess has been working so hard on building an OB-CBL and inpatient CBL so we can cover all major areas that might take care of a septic patient. Um, could we advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> um, another avenue we can take is to offer virtual training or simulation. Um, I offer this with a quick introduction to quality healthcare, which includes core measures like SEP1, and then I launch a patient's room and I tell them to go have at it, just like the patient you see on your slide. And it lets the students point out the quality of care concerns. And I had little tidbits of information through the simulation. In this scenario, the patient was admitted for sepsis due to pneumonia, which allows me an opportunity to discuss what that means to take care of a septic patient. Another option that combines real-time self-paced education and resources is to provide a QR code. And we recommend putting this on a badge buddy. We have a QR code specifically for nurses and a QR code specifically for providers that takes them to a site full of algorithms, decision trees, and guidance like talking points that the staff member can quickly navigate through when they need it. Another virtual opportunity that we did not include in these slides but is worth mentioning is to present at Grand Rounds. Every month we host multiple Grand Rounds based on the focus, so nursing or quality, and if you have this opportunity at your organization, we highly recommend taking advantage of this because you have the potential of reaching staff you may normally not get in front of, especially if you are a larger organization or a system of hospitals and clinics. Now, the next slide is my favorite part, which is learning through gameplay. Studies have shown that interactive and gameplay education can enhance the learning experience and increase knowledge obtained compared to a traditional lecture setting. We run our escape room with a live patient, meaning one of us actually plays the role of the patient and the nurse has 20 minutes to save their patient from sepsis. We provide the staff members with a safe, controlled environment so mistakes can and will purposefully, because we do that, happen. So when they are in the real life environment, we hope it doesn't happen with the patient. We have received feedback time and time again that the nurses have gone, from the nurses that have gone through our escape room, that they feel more confident in their skills of recognizing sepsis and to speak up to advocate for their patients thanks to this engagement. And I will pass it back to Jess. Thank you, Alexis. Next slide, please. All right, so when we were building this presentation, the question came from others asking us, what is this term OFI? What does it stand for? So in our organization, we use the term OFI as it means opportunity for improvement, specifically with the SEP1 core measure. Um, OFIs occur when there has been any kind of deviation from best practice. This is where our evidence is rooted and we know those clinical practice guidelines are best practice. So once a deviation has been identified, what this means is that the bundle wasn't completed in its entirety, which means it could be a care issue or it may be that there's documentation that isn't there. It's either lacking the support of everything that it needs to have within that chart um, or we didn't document why we didn't do something. So then maybe the patient refused IV fluids, the patient refused blood cultures, whatever it may be. So we like to look at these from that perspective. And it's very important when we are 
uh, discussing these gaps that we remember that we use the term OFI or opportunity for improvement. And we do not use the word fallout because oftentimes there can be a negative connotation that's associated with the word fallout. However, as we use OFI as an opportunity to learn and grow from that opportunity, um, we then work then to improve our care for the next patient and the one after that. So OFIs are not punitive in nature. They're identified as an area where a gap has been identified. And if, as we know, every time you identify a gap, it leads to the PDSA cycle and then it leads to better patient outcomes down the road. So this allows our team to review what we can do then as the sepsis team to support our providers and our nursing staff, such as Alexis talked about getting dot phrases, building order sets, badge buddies, all of these are crucial elements to building your sepsis program. And it, through the use of OFIs, it allows us to be able to do this. So every OFI is sent to the entire care team. So this includes doctor, nurse, if a nurse practitioner or PA was on it. Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody is put together as a team. And this really enhances everybody's ability to take something back from this case, because then when a doctor gets an email, they respond all and the nurse gets to see their feedback as well. So it's really, really valuable. But every time an OFI is sent, like I said, it goes to the entire team. We want to encourage them to work together to bridge those gaps. And then we um, can provide that education, like I mentioned earlier. So as we are one team, we're doing great work and everybody deserves that education provided the same way. Next slide. So before an OFI is sent out to the entire care team, it first goes through the inter-rater reliability process. So for any OFI to happen, it first must arise from the care being provided. Although this slide says provider, it can be a nurse, it could be a phlebotomist, it could be a pharmacist, anyone at all involved in the care for the patient at the time the OFI occurred. And then the sepsis team, either myself or my partner, Joe, that's my clinical sepsis nurse, we review those charts in real time. And then we know that a sepsis consult's been placed. These consults are derived from order sets. So these can be our physician order sets or even standing delegated nursing order sets. And then once we get consulted, Joe performs a real-time review of that chart, looking for any opportunities that are present in real time. And then what does he do? He reaches out to them through either like epic message, epic chat, but we're trying to correct that documentation while the patient is still in house. And that is really valuable to the program to have that real time feedback given right away. And we are also fortunate to have a CDI or a clinical documentation integrity program here at JPS. This department looks at patients concurrently while they are still in the hospital or shortly after discharge to ensure all pertinent conditions are documented to the highest accuracy with clinical evidence to support that condition. If there is a CDI specialist on the account, then they will review for clinical validity and will query the provider when sepsis becomes unclear or if there's an opportunity to clarify specificity and or severity of the condition prior to it going to final coding. And then we have our SEP1 abstractor, Amanda Lewis, another phenomenal member of our team. And I say team a lot as we're going through this because I, just as the program leader, I can't do it all on my own. I have a phenomenal team that I get to work with. And Amanda is one of those members. So she reviews 100% of the CMS SEP1 accounts that we have. We are really unique in that we do 100%. We do not do a sample with our SEP1. So it is really important to distinguish which ones were a sepsis consult, it was at real time, versus when they're in the hospital. When Amanda looks at these cases, it is very important to realize that these patients have been discharged, they've gone through the coding process, and now we really can't change the documentation. So we're looking at those as a gap and looking to see how we can fill that gap. So anytime that an OFI is identified, then it is left to myself or Joe to review those and we review them and I'm gonna let Alexis take the next one and go on there. I got you Jess. So after the OFI has been identified, um, so as Jess said, after coding, 
uh, the account goes through another validation point where sepsis coordinator Jess reviews the account to see if she agrees with the OFI did indeed take place. If there is an opportunity uh, to impact the OFI, maybe new documentation has presented itself or a different view highlights something that would exclude the account from the bundle requirement, the account is then sent back to Amanda in quality and we all discuss. At this point, if there is an opportunity to clarify sepsis, in the documentation, such as was it ruled out or uh, do we need a higher severity or do we need the organ dysfunction, um, then CDI can send a query to the provider to get it clarified. We have found some OFIs occur because the provider didn't think the patient truly had sepsis, but due to poor documentation of this clinical decision, sepsis ultimately gets picked up and coded on the final bill. If the account did not have a CDI specialist assigned while well in-house, we still have the opportunity during this process right here to send the account to CDI for review. If sepsis is removed from final coding due to the clarified documentation, the OFI is also removed. This allows us to have some validation of the SEP1 compliance rate. And I'll pass it back to Jess. And so if after all of these steps that we have gone through, and it is very robust, the OFI remains to be valid, which means that the OFI will stand, then I send it out to that provider team, as I mentioned um, in the OFI slide. So I send the OFI out, I send a timeline with it, and then I request a response with feedback within seven days of my initial email. Um, it has in the email exactly what an OFI is. And then it has an attribution, which is very important because we're not placing blame. It's simply saying, my ED provider, this is attributed to you. And then I need you to respond within seven days and tell me what we can do to support you to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Next slide. So this is probably one of my favorite slides, but as you can see, SEP1 compliance rate has so many impacts including the CMS overall star rating, which is publicly reported. This way the patient can look at the quality rating of the hospitals in which they're seeking care from. The SEP1 is also moving into value-based purchasing world and knowing that we'll need to have, um, everybody will need to start upping their game with their sepsis program, which this webinar comes at an amazing time. So I am thrilled to share this graph with you. And so as you can see, the orange line is the national CMS SEP1, and it teeters right below 60%, followed by Texas, where JPS resides, which is in the red. And so that one is about 62 to 64% every year for the state of Texas. Now, the blue line, that's us. And yes, we are proud. But this shows that having this multidisciplinary committee and program really does help move the mark. And what we're hoping is that you can see that we have put a heavy emphasis on a team and on education. And by doing that, we're able to be above the state and national average. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to present on this. Thank you for sharing. And uh, I love how you frame everything as a teachable moment, um, even not calling something a fallout, but calling it an OFI. I just feel like that's a really important distinction and it, it really brings together that team atmosphere. Um, our next presentation will be from Dr. Stephanie Parks-Taylor. Dr. Parks-Taylor is a professor of medicine and chief of the division of hospital medicine at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on improving patient outcomes and developing innovative practices to promote optimal care for sepsis in both early antibiotic management and post-discharge transition and recovery. She employs her expertise in health, service re health services research, pragmatic trials, large data sets, and implementation science to identify and address essential healthcare questions related to quality, value, and equity of care. Dr. Parks Taylor, I'm excited to hear how you've implemented this education core element into your sepsis program. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, and it's great to follow up the um, uh, Jessica and Alexis's team. I think you'll see some kind of overlying themes uh, in, in my presentation, although I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk specifically about education directed towards patients and their families. Um, that is sort of a partner uh, 
a companion to education that's provided to, to providers and clinicians and staff. I'm going to describe work that we have done at Atrium Health. I have an adjunct appointment at Atrium Health and was there for several years. Um, Atrium Health is a large uh, integrated health system. The work that we did really focused on 10 hospitals in North Carolina, ranging from large urban academic centers to more smaller rural hospitals um, in North Carolina. Um, so at Atrium Health, we recognized that uh, sepsis patients not only needed focus on that early management period, that golden hour that uh, Dr. Prescott mentioned where antibiotics and other management needs to get in quickly, but also they experience persistent deficits and struggles even after that early period. And so we developed a program um, to help support patients in that recovery, a lot of it which is after discharge. Um, we developed a program that we uh, called the Sepsis Transition and Recovery Program or the STAR program. Um, and this was a, a, a a institutional supported program uh, that used a nurse navigator or nurse navigators to deliver best practice care for sepsis patients in that vulnerable period, right around the time of hospital discharge and for uh, um, 90 days after discharge. This is a slide that it sort of shows a schematic of the activities that the STAR nurse navigators uh, perform for patients. Um, and I'll highlight the areas where education really pops up, um, which you'll kind of see is throughout the whole program. So nurse navigators will identify patients while they're still in the hospital um, and do some uh, support uh, and literacy assessments, health literacy assessments while they're in the hospital. In the preparation for hospital discharge, our navigators will provide sepsis education to patients and their families kind of about what happened to them. Um, again, using the word sepsis, what is sepsis um, and what they can expect after discharge. And then our sepsis nurse navigators will make phone calls to patients in within 48 hours of discharge. And then again, at regular intervals, um, every few days for the first month and then every week for the rest of the 90-day period. And during those intervals, lots of bits of education are provided um, related to uh, medication review, medication literacy, um, care coordination, and um, continued disease-specific education, what to expect, all of those types of things. And I'll get a little more specific about some of the tools we use for that um, later on. So just to share some outcomes of this program, um, kind of so that you know that what we're doing works um, and we feel really uh, proud of this. Um, so we conducted a randomized controlled trial um, at three of the hospitals in North Carolina. We enrolled about 700 patients and we compared patients who received uh, support through the STAR program versus patients who uh, received sort of the usual transition care support. And we found that patients who were supported with the STAR program had a about 5% lower risk of readmission or mortality at 30 days compared to patients who did not receive support through the STAR program. Um, and so that outcome was at 30 days. We also looked at a longer term outcome. Is this program having a kind of transformational impact on patients' clinical trajectory? So we looked at outcomes at 12 months and found that similarly, patients who received support with the STAR program had about a 7.5% lower risk of readmission or mortality at 12 months after discharge compared to sepsis patients who um, were just receiving usual care. So I'll dig in a little bit to the specifics related to education and what this program was providing. Um, oh, just sort of a reminder, the STAR program was a, a multi-component uh, delivery program that focused on, on lots of different things, symptom management, um, assessment of, of new deficits and treatment of new deficits, care coordination, but again, education was a really big one of those components. So. This slide, uh, kind of highlighting the different time points uh, that I mentioned in the other slide, really we, a guiding principle that we used to design the education component of the STAR program was that substance education is not kind of a one-off thing. It should be a kind of regular long-term process for patients to really understand exactly what sepsis is and what the expectations are. I mean, we expect, we take medical students and nursing students quite a long time to understand sepsis, and then we expect patients to get it all with one little document that they get at, at discharge, one piece of paper. Um, and so that's just not realistic. And we realized that the education needed to come at multiple intervals at different bits when, when it made sense. And so the three different intervals 
um, kind of schematically represented here is we provide ex, uh, education right in that preparation for hospital discharge uh, period where patients have lots of questions or family members have lots of questions in the immediate post-acute, so right after they get discharged, and then in that extended post-acute where they have up to 90 days to continue to get support and continue to re receive education about their, um, their sepsis event. Um, and drilling down a little bit deeper into those specific areas at that preparation for hospital discharge period, um, really that's where we start with that disease specific education, um, where we use the word sepsis, we make sure that the patient and the family know that they actually had sepsis, they didn't just have pneumonia or UTI, but they had sepsis and then that carries the, the weight behind it in terms of what to expect and um, how seriously to take it um, that I think uh, Jessica had mentioned as well. Um, a part of the education here is also uh, reviewing the hospital course and making sure they understand what actually happened to them and what they can expect after discharge. And then the immediate post-acute period, so within 48 hours or a few days after discharge, um, you know, patients are at home or in a new setting and they have lots and lots of questions and they need to sort of be re-educated, um, again, reminded what sepsis is and why and and uh, what that means for them, but also re-educated in terms of what the medications are on and why they're taking them, what follow-up appointments they have and why it's important for them to, to follow them. Another thing that we found in our some of our uh, qualitative work is that sepsis patients are really worried about getting sepsis again. Um, and so there's a lot of anxiety and stress related to not knowing how will I know if I, ha I have sepsis again? And so we do a lot of education around symptom monitoring. Here's what to look out for. Here's when to call for help, um, those type of things. And we provide education around kind of reset expectations that you may not have the same functional abilities as you did pre-sepsis. Um, these are the things we're going to do to help you build back those uh, skills up. Um, but, you know, don't be surprised if, if some of these uh, limitations are new. You're not alone in that. And then the extended post-acute, again, just because all of this is such a um, busy, complicated time for patients and their families, just continuing that, we were so lucky to be able to deliver this program for 90 days, that continued touch points where um, th that kind of same information could be uh, repeated and questions could be asked um, in that long-term uh, education period, we help them begin to uh, transition to follow up with their PCP and making sure that um, everyone's on on the same page as far as what happens, what's expected. Um, and then at this at this time, we also provide education around the impact of sepsis on long term mortality risk and long term complication risks. And we use that as an opportunity to revisit their goals of care um, to make sure that we do know really um, clearly what their goals are and what type of uh, health care, what type of decisions they would want in the future. I'll just briefly touch on some of the specific tools that we do provide. Um, so in that pre-preparation uh, for discharge while patients are still in the hospital, we have them watch this uh, Life After Sepsis video. It's sponsored by the Sepsis Alliance and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Um, it's available on YouTube. Uh, so we uh, assign this to patients while they're in the hospital and have them watch it, um, preferably with their family member. Um, this video kind of gives a really nice insight into what to expect um, after sepsis. We use the Life After Sepsis fact sheet um, that's uh, available through the CDC um, and some of the, you can go to the next slide, some of the specific uh, things that are addressed on this sheet. Um, again, what is sepsis? And I, I will say this about 10 times, and I think Jessica and Alexa said this too, is using the word sepsis is so critical. Um, it's one of the things we hear from patients all the time. Nobody ever told me I had sepsis. What do you mean I have sepsis? Um, and so it's so important to, to use that word and to make sure patients understand how, how serious it was and what, um, what the persistent risks are for them afterwards. This is still from the Life After Sepsis uh, fact sheet. Um, some of the expectations, um, this is, that's fine. Uh, some of the expectations that people, uh, we can set for people. Again, people get home and they, they think, well, I just had pneumonia, I got antibiotics, I should be all better. Um, and it can be a huge source of anxiety and stress and kind of alteration in social roles, uh, all these different things that people can have. And so we try to educate them on what the expectations are and particularly the sense that this is not just you. This is a really common thing that happens to people. 
Um, a couple more things. This is a um, kind of education around uh, care coordination, uh, sort of how we say it. So, uh, so much happening in that acute uh, post-acute period, lots of appointments to get to, medications to take, uh, medications change, right? So you may have medications that you were sent on after the hospitalization that you're supposed to stop and your home meds, you're supposed to restart. So mm-hmm. we try to give a lot of education and uh, some structured forms for people to get that Uh, keep that organized. And then this is a stoplight tool that I had mentioned earlier that we give to help people um, monitor their symptoms and kind of get some guidance for when to seek help. Um, This particular tool is from Sutter Health, but I think there's a a variety of different options available out there. But um, we found that this both serves a practical purpose by truly telling patients when to call when they need help, but it also provides a lot of reassurance for for patients who where that uncertainty and that anxiety of how will I know if I have sepsis again, what will I do? Um, it kind of gives that guidance that gives them a bit of a peace of mind that they know what to do. And so just to summarize all of that, um, some of the key points um, from our learnings and the work that we have done um, for post-sepsis uh, patient and family education, um, really key that it's a dynamic process. The, the one-time uh, sepsis information at discharge p- piece of paper really isn't going to cut it. This should be a dynamic process um, that's delivered multiple time points through the recovery. Um, again, use the word sepsis as much as you can um, for patients and their family, and also in communication with other care providers. So with the PCP or with other people that are caring for the patient, use the word sepsis so that it's very clear um, what the patient has been through and what to expect after discharge. And our education tools, um, we uh, the highlights of the things that we address, uh, we summarize the hospitalization events, um, we provide education around medications, around their expectations and anticipatory guidance, uh, best practices that they should be taking on for recovery, um, and again, a, a structured process for when to act and who to call if they start to experience new or worsening symptoms. And that's all I have. Hopefully got it through quickly enough that we have plenty of time for questions. We do. Thank you. Thanks for going through that. I think a lot of times, the reminder that you had to use the word sepsis, I think, A lot of times we're concerned that it's going to set off too much anxiety with patients, but it's really not fair if we don't give them all of the information about their their, um, process of what's been in the hospital and then what to expect afterwards. So let's kick off our question and answer session with some questions that have come in. Uh, The first one uh, hopefully will be easy for uh, Jessica. We'll start with you. How many sepsis cases, cases do you usually have per month and how many abstractors do you have? So for the CMS step one versus cons. Okay. So uh, we have a hat 155, I think a month is typically what we have, um, give or take, but we have one full-time abstractor. One. So that, pers- that person is busy. <laughs> and that's why she's so dynamic on our team. Uh, Alexis, uh, for you, how do you balance the different definitions of sepsis in the quality world versus the coding world? Great question. Um, So with coding, there is no definition. It is what is documented. So if it is clearly documented as sepsis or clearly documented as septic shock, then that is what will get coded. Now, there is a clinical validation piece where that is kind of where that definition might balance through. Um, Because we do align with SEP1, we do use sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock um, as our definition, and it's an adopted definition for our um, organization. So if that's a conversation that has not happened yet to set a standard, then that's absolutely something that should be done as well. So everybody consistently throughout the organization has the same definition of what sepsis is. Thanks for that. That's always a big question, the different different definitions and which ones to lean upon. Uh, Dr. Parks-Taylor, I've got one for you. Grace uh, wrote in and asked if you had additional funding for the staff that you need to provide the education and follow up for these sepsis patients. Like many, I'm sure Grace is at a small hospital with limited resources, especially post pandemic. So she's trying to figure out how to implement uh, an educational program like yours on limited resources. 
Yeah, that, that's a fabulous question um, and always something that we're thinking about in healthcare is trying to, how do we do more with less? Um, I, our program was kind of unique in that we um, initially had gotten some institutional support for our navigators and then we applied for some uh, NIH funding that supported our navigators for um for a five-year period, and now we're taking those those data, that kind of return on investment data, and uh, getting support uh, again, institutional support for that. Um, so, uh, my opinion, uh, and I think there's data to support it, is that there's clear return on investment um, for for that kind of support. We intentionally designed the program to be relatively low cost. We have nurse navigators who work remotely. They just use the telephone. It's not it's not super fancy. Um, and they they because they work remotely, they can reach different hospitals and patients from pretty far reaching. And a nurse navigator can handle about 50 patients um, at a time. Um, they, they're incredible, incredible clinicians. Um, and so, so we find there's relatively high impact for not a super high cost. There obviously is some cost, but I, I think there's an argument to be made on return on investment, and this is a pretty low cost uh, intervention. It's so important to show the benefits to administration, um, not just in patient satisfaction scores, but financial as well. So thanks for showing us how to do that. Uh, Dr. Prescott, maybe I could um, uh, send this one your way. Is This is from Esther. She wants to know if there's a process that you can recommend when patients come through the emergency department with extremely poor prognosis and helping um, physicians identify which patients might benefit more from the comfort care only uh, as opposed to um, full sort of hospital acute care. Yeah, um, that's a great question um, and something that, yeah, we face all the time also in the intensive care unit. Um, I think that this probably highlights the importance of having conversations with patients and their families and try to convey in sort of realistic terms, what is our assessment of prognosis? I think it's also important to always be humble and recognize that, that you know, Sometimes we're wrong, um, but sort of our, you know, this is our best expectation of what's going to happen um, and sort of what treatment would entail. And then hear from the patient and family. What are the things that they value? Right. I think that there's not necessarily a right answer in terms of these are criteria that you should get treated this way and these are criteria you should get treated that way. It's really about trying to elicit the patient goals and preferences and trying to provide care that 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 best honors those um, preferences. Thank you for that thoughtful, uh, thoughtful response. Uh, Stacy, um, yes. maybe had something to add to oh, that. Go right ahead. Yes, go. Did not want to interrupt. Um, I I would also like to make a plug for a palliative care consult. If um if you do have palliative care at your organization, they are a fantastic team that can help guide that conversation as well. Um, we have a um, relationship with our palliative care and we even have a screening tool for anybody who um, might be on the fence of if they are needed or not. Uh, we always side on the side of caution of, you know what, let's just go ahead and put the consult in. And if they say no, thank you, then the patient can say no, thank you. But I uh, just want to put that plug out as well for palliative care. They are an amazing team that can help with those very difficult discussions as well. Oh, thank you so much. The palliative care is a remarkable field, and I I am always humbled by the folks that that go into that field. Uh, so thank you for reminding us uh, of their worth here. Um, this is to the JPS folks. Uh, lots of people writing in, like myself, very intrigued by your escape room. And uh, one wanted to know if you only focus on sepsis through that escape room, or if it if you have broader learning uh, tools that you put through that that room. Yes, and then Alexis can finish. So in our escape room, one of the things that we do is these patients that they are coming in to take care of during the escape room are sepsis isn't even on the radar. These are stroke, DKA, end-stage renal disease, um, uh, DT, DKA, different things. So they don't even suspect sepsis. And that is the whole point of it because we want them to be aware that they're always underlying things going on with the patient. And so for these patients, that is exactly what it is. It's a phenomenal learning experience. And I'll let Alexis um, end it with that. You uh, you nailed it. So uh, one of the things like with our stroke patients, we have them have to actually go through the NIHSS 
scoring. Um, and so what we do is we have clues hidden through our escape room. And one of them is when they lift the patient's leg, there's a clue underneath there. So they actually have to go through the steps, which helps them to also learn about stroke assessment. And then also just like you were saying, we do CWA for our alcohol withdrawal patients and things like that. So yes, there are other learning opportunities kind of sprinkled into our escape room as well. Well, I personally think you should take that show on the road because I think that a lot of other facilities would really um, find benefit in that. So um, I'll, I mean, you can come to my place first. Um, mm -hmm. Last question I think we have is for Dr. Parks Taylor. How many staff members are on your team for the uh, sepsis patient education model that you presented? That's a great question. There's, it's not a, a clear answer. It's It's been in flux. Again, I, hinting to the prior question, I think it was from Grace about support. It you know depends on how much financial support we have. We would take 100 um, if, if someone would pay us to do that. Um, we've been anywhere from when we first started, we had one, um, and then we've flexed up to four or five, and then you know gone down, up and down. But um, it, we again, as many as, as the system will support, because I, it, there's obviously a market for it, an opportunity for it, um, and we think it has a big impact. Great. Well, thank thank you, and thank you all for such an intriguing discussion. I'd like to summarize what we've learned throughout these webinars. In a typical year, at least 1.7 million adults in America develop sepsis, and at least 350,000 of them die during their hospitalization or are discharged to hospice. One in three people who dies in a hospital had sepsis during that hospitalization. We must work to improve every aspect of our sepsis program so that we can continue to support the care of patients with sepsis and save lives. In this webinar series, we have heard from experts on all seven of the new core elements. First, hospital leadership commitment is dedicating the necessary human, financial, and information technology resources. Second, accountability is appointing a leader or co-leaders responsible for program goals and outcomes. Third, multi-professional expertise is engaging key partners throughout the hospital and healthcare system. Fourth, Action is implementing structures and processes to improve the identification of, management of, and recovery from sepsis. Fifth, tracking is measuring sepsis epidemiology, management, and outcomes to assess the impact of sepsis initiatives and progress toward program goals. Sixth, reporting is providing information on sepsis management and outcomes to relevant partners. And finally, education is providing sepsis education to healthcare professionals patients, as well as their family and caregivers. As with all webinars in this series, a recording will be available on this page shortly. You will also find helpful links and websites in the resources tab in the top left corner above the video. I want to thank Dr. Prescott and all of our panelists throughout this series for leading us through these new core elements and sharing the ways these elements can be individualized for different facilities and programs. One last big thank you to you, our audience, for your ongoing interest and dedication to reducing the morbidity and mortality associated with sepsis. Given the complexities of, of sepsis care, having this forum to learn about and share different ideas will no doubt give all of us new tools as we shape our own sepsis programs. We encourage you all to continue to collaborate with each other and share your successes. Thank you.